Hello, I'm Ilya Shervinsky, and you're watching TDP World Talks, where every word matters. So, the latest Polish expedition to the Arctic is about to embark on its journey. And one might think, okay, so why are we talking about this? Since it's no longer the final frontier, we already basically know what is out there, unlike, say, in the 19th or the 18th century. However, this expedition matters quite a lot, actually, because it may allow us to learn more about the changes which our climate and our environment is undergoing due to human activities. And we will be asking questions concerning this and many other aspects of the expedition to our guest today, Mikołaj Golachowski, biologist and polar explorer. Hello and welcome to TDP World. Hello, thank you for the invitation. So first and foremost, um, in layman's terms, uh, can you tell us ab the, about the basics of the expedition? We've already um, basically made it clear in the intro just a moment ago that Poland has quite an extensive presence in the Spitsbergen. There is not one, not two, uh, but actually five research facilities operated by different Polish research institutions. So which one is involved in this particular expedition? Well, this is this applies to the Hornsund station, named after Shedlecki. So this is our main station in the Arctic. But yes, as just like you mentioned, we also have several others run by different universities. This one is run by Polish Academy of Sciences, so it's like sort of for the whole country, not not run by a particular city or university, but uh, it's uh, it's for all of Poland. So basically, what are the objectives this time around? Because it's not going to be the first expedition there. Uh, the research activity has been going on for decades, in fact. But why is it relevant today? Uh, I think it's increasingly relevant because, uh, as you probably know, uh, the Arctic, as well as parts of the Antarctic, are the regions that change uh, much more rapidly than other places on our planet. In fact, in Svalbard, uh, climate change is up to seven times faster than the global average. So polar regions have become, over the last few years, but uh, generally are becoming more and more relevant for uh, what we want to find out about what's happening and uh, for our future. That's why I think that this is quite a major focus of a lot of scientists these days. Both polar regions, they act as, uh, if you like, uh, air conditioning system for our planet. And the fact that they are changing so much means that the uh, changes all over the place will be actually accelerating. And why do they change so quickly? Well, there is this phenomenon called the polar amplification, and it's to do with the surface that is covered by the ice and snow. Uh, we're talking about so-called albedo effect. An albedo effect is when you basically uh, shine on a, on the surface and how much of that uh, light or, or even energy in general is reflected. And the lighter the surface, the more uh, energy is reflected. So if you have the area covered by ice and snow, uh, up to 90% of the energy from the sun is uh, reflected. However, that uh, energy starts to uh, thaw the ice and snow, and therefore you have an exposure of more dark rocks and uh, seawater, and that in turn absorbs a lot of energy, which means that uh, w when you have those dark surfaces exposed, there is more heat uh, accepted by the surface of our planet, and that, in turn, melts more ice and snow. So there's this vicious circle uh, of a positive feedback. There's nothing positive about it, but uh, it is a positive feedback. When the more you melt the snow, then you end up melting even more snow because of that dark surface that has been exposed. That's why these ch places change so quickly. This is why research in those places is so relevant. 
And that also sounds as if this is something that might be very difficult, if not impossible, to ever reverse, even if uh, the level of involvement in protection of um, our climate and atmosphere increases dramatically, and it doesn't seem like it's going to do in the near future. Uh, but it's also, I think, relevant, because um, you've mentioned that this is a scientific phenomenon. Most people don't really understand sophisticated scientific terms. But actually, there are sometimes events which raise awareness of these phenomena, Recently, for example, a man uh, named Duncan Porter has published a set of pictures on Twitter. We're going to show them to our viewers in just a moment. And they basically show changes on a glacier in Switzerland, uh, which uh, at first glance it might seem, okay, it's a different region. Nevertheless, it has generated quite a powerful response from users because it shows just how much has changed during, I think, 15 years. So do you think that... Um, right now with greater awareness of these phenomena, expeditions such as that will also get greater exposure and will be able to influence uh, the general thinking of the general public to a greater extent than before. Well, yes, these pic pictures are quite powerful. There was a series of pictures published a few years ago as well from Svalbard uh, when somebody made the effort to recreate a picture taken in the 1920s, uh, so about 100 years ago. And they had people coming to exactly the same spot. Uh, you can see it by the outline of the rocks that are exposed. It's exactly the same place. But uh, in the old pictures, the glacier is there. And in the new pictures, the glacier is not there anymore, or it's much thinner or further away. So yes, pictures are powerful. But you know, one thing we all need to remember is that Glaciers have always been very dynamic, right? And uh, by the way, when we say a glacier is retreating, we don't mean that it sort of uh, goes up suddenly, up the hill where it was formed, because every piece of ice always moves forward. So the glacier is always advancing. It's just that uh, the face of it is breaking at a faster rate than it accumulates up there in the mountains which means it goes forward still, but uh, it shrinks, if you like, because it's cut off earlier and earlier. So yes, pictures are very powerful, but um, pictures themselves don't prove anything. Just like the, also the fact that I've been working in polar regions for the last 22 years now, and uh, yet my personal experience proves nothing because this is what we call anecdotal evidence, right? Just because some guy has seen this glacier many years ago and now this glacier is in a different place, that proves nothing because things like this have been happening before. However, we know uh, of the global changes and we know of the uh, shrinking of the glaciers because of very thorough research that is performed uh, amongst other places at the, at the Polish stations in Svalbard. So, Beyond any doubt, we can see that, yes, they are shrinking, both in the surface area, but also they are thinning. Uh, I've recently spoken to a professor. Uh, he's actually Polish, but he works at the University of Taiwan, and he studies uh, some of the glaciers in Svalbard. And he says that during just the summertime, during the two or three months of summer, uh, his glaciers have thinned by more than two meters which is absolutely amazing. This is, this is something that had never happened before, uh, that such a rate is, uh, is happening. And uh, they're also shrinking in the, in the surface area as well. There is a, the, the benefits of coming to a place for a long time is that sometimes you can see uh, an example of what's happening. And there is a famous glacier in Svalbard called Monaco Bren, and or Monaco, Monaco Glacier, and it's one of the largest. When I first saw it, it was in 2010. Uh, it was one long glacier front, uh, about seven kilometers long, uh, with a rock that was sort of, well, rock. You could call it a mountain, I guess. It was sort of close to that uh, front of that glacier. Uh, but we knew that the glacier is going back. Well, as I said, it's not never going back per se, but it's shrinking. So, uh, then in 2015, so five years after I saw it, uh, that mountain, which was sort of close to the front of the glacier, now 
is at the front of the glacier, splitting the glacier effectively in two. And now, when I last saw it about a month ago, uh, the same glacier is now definitely two, and that mountain is halfway out. It's obviously not the mountain moving forward, it's the glacier going. So, yes, those changes are uh, easy to observe. And I also don't think that uh, I completely agree with you, because you said that uh, people may not understand complicated scientific terms. I guess that depends on how you present them. No, of course With it does. It certainly on... does. Yeah. I, I was just referring to this because yeah, apart effect, from you know apart from scientific true. discourse we also sometimes have uh, social media where things presented in simple terms we actually uh, encourage people to to dig deeper ah. to actually seek some more complex knowledge and at that point uh, terms which might have seen abstruse at first they will become clear now l let me ask you another question because unfortunately we are slowly approaching the end of our interview uh, what other types of research which are also relevant to what's happening today uh, are being carried carried out by Polish explorers in the Arctic? Because we've already mentioned climate change, but there are so many different uh, fields of study. Uh, so can you tell us more about, uh, about those? Yeah, of course. Uh, we study pretty much everything there is to study. Uh, and uh, changes in the ecosystems are another... I'm a biologist by training and by profession, which means that for me, that is the changes in the ecosystems that are more striking than those uh, happening in uh, on the glaciers. Uh, I know this, but I have never studied them per se. Uh, so in the ecosystem, you can see the composition of species uh, changing. Some uh, are increasing in numbers, some are decreasing in numbers, and you have new species uh, arriving. And this is all uh, a topic of research of the Polish scientists when you and you also find and this is something that I uh, I quite uh, uh, I found quite interesting that a few years we also have seen the big animals that are there we know, know that polar bears have been in the Arctic right uh, however they are very closely tied to the sea ice and they need it for hunting and for traveling and so normally they would be feeding mostly on seals. However, with the uh, cover of the sea ice that is uh, there for a shorter time every year, and there's less of the sea ice, they are adapting to new situations. And a few years ago at the Polish station, there was a, a situation when they saw a polar bear chasing a reindeer. Normally reindeer run faster than polar bears, and they still do, but I think that chances are that bear is just a little bit smarter. So this polar bear chased that rain very narrow peninsula uh, to water, uh, faster on land, but they're slower in the water. So the polar bear caught the reindeer, killed it in the water, and then dragged it to the shore. And the same thing happened three days later, probably with the same bear. But this was the first ever record of such behavior in the world, the uh, first ever video that was taken by the people at the police station. So we see that animals are also adapting to those changes and they're changing their behavior accordingly, which is quite fascinating if you think about it. No, it is fascinating, but it is also disturbing the way that they are forced to react to totally different environment, which all of a sudden just creeps up upon Absolutely. them and forces them to behave differently. And perhaps this is the best way to actually finish our conversation. Hopefully we might be able to actually explore these topics at a later stage in greater depth. For the time being, Mikołaj Golachowski, biologist and polar explorer, was our guest today here on TDP World. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. And I'm Anna Shrebnyski, you're watching TDP World, please do stay with us.